Hello, everybody. Thanks very much uh, for the session so far. It has been an amazing Global Biodiversity Festival. The thing that got me excited last year was that we had no time to prepare. And, I, and it seemed like a mad idea. That was a green light to me. And I said, let's just do it. It ran like clockwork. So that means that we're running this year on a much more ambitious schedule. So some of these sessions are pre-recorded so we can fit them all in. And by a huge amount of generosity from both these next gentlemen, we've managed to do this session on finance. So it really is with deep, heartfelt pleasure and warmth that I welcome my dear friend, Justin Mundy. Uh, Justin is the man that I go to when I need to understand finance. Um, please do look at Justin Mundy online and you will see this man's got great depth and has asked particularly to be uh, recorded on this global biodiversity as an environmentalist, which we absolutely love. Some people spend a long time getting longer titles in their life and Justin has gone for the shortest possible. And my new friend is Simon, uh, Simon Zadek, who I've just met. And Simon, thank you very much for joining us. Simon has also asked to be introduced with a short title as a reformed economist. But you should know that uh, Dr. Zadek, Simon, is the chair of the Finance for Biodiversity, of the group that we heard from earlier. So these two gentlemen are going to have a chat. And it's one of those conversations that, to me, I often feel as if this kind of stuff is so important to us. It gives us hope. It gives us energy when we're working hard in the front line. And yet, I don't really understand how it works. Um, so over to you, two gentlemen. Please tell us how it works. Have a good chat. And I'll see you in about 20 minutes or so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be um, doing this with Simon Zarek, but also to have been introduced by by Paul, who is uh, the go-to person for me when life seems difficult and complicated because it's like being plugged into a national grid with his uh, his amazing energy and, and sense of hope and inspiration. Um, Sam, you and I have been positioned here to talk about some of the finance around biodiversity and what's needed. And I thought, if I may, I just quickly set the scene about giving some figures, which we can then move away from. Um, I've certainly spent the last 40 years knocking on people's doors saying we need to have more money for biodiversity conservation for uh, environmental activities um so that's been a well spent 40 years because we are still in quite a bit of a hole one way or the other although things are improving um one of the things which perhaps is improving is that we've had over the last few years a number of very substantive reports which have tried to quantify some of the financial and economic issues around biodiversity and ecosystem services. So some of the figures which have come out um, are, for instance, from the World Economic Forum, that we have $44 trillion um, uh, of direct global economic value added every year, and 50% of the world's GDP depends on nature. Uh, the Waldron Report last year was saying that we have $125 trillion provided by ecosystem services every year. Um, and yet, at the same time, we know that despite this, and of course, there's a, there's a reduction of absurdium problem here, whereby we assume somehow that these figures, when quantified, are the basis and the value of, of the ecology and of ecosystem integrity. When, of course, we know that if our ecosystems collapse, there is no economic value, there is no economic or financial additionality that can be possibly um, attained because we as a civilization will have ceased. But as we are here at the current moment, we know that uh, at the we have a currently a spend of $500 billion a year on subsidies, um, which have an economic cost of four to $6 trillion a year. That's from the desk to review. Uh, we know that in terms of protected areas, we spend about um, $80 billion a year, which is about the same the world spends on ice cream. And we know from the Warden Report that we need actually $140 billion a year um, to be spent, which is less than the world spends on video games. Uh, we know that protected areas uh, currently get 33% of what they need, uh, which is about $24 billion um, of the $68 billion. But we also know that 30%, um, if we were to protect 30% of the world, we would have an additional economic output of between $260 billion to $350 billion. Um, sorry, $260 billion plus a further $350 billion of non-monetizable um, benefits. 
And yet, and yet, at the moment, even the small sums that are flowing, only 30% comes from the private sector, 70% comes from the public sector. And of that 70%, we know because of COVID and the crunch on ODA, that that amount of money is going to be considerably constricted and constrained, which is going to be potentially a real problem as countries search for some uh, fiscal headroom in a post-COVID recovery. So all of that, that sets the scene in terms of um, the, the quantity of cash that's needed, uh, what we're currently not providing. And yet there is hope, I think, um, A, because we are starting to see a, a convergence between the understanding of climate change, biodiversity and economic growth. We're starting to understand that as the market mechanisms are being developed, science-based targets are the absolute um, sine qua non, the fundamental basis uh, for measurement of impact and transition pathways. And so those who are on listening to this uh, conversation, who are out there gathering data, being eaten by mosquitoes and wondering what on earth they're doing in a swamp, you are doing really valuable work because your um, papers, your reports, your endeavours, your analysis will be the fundamental building blocks for a, a market approach to try and resolve some of these problems. So, dear Simon, you have been an expert in this field for so many years and know far more about it than, than, than most people in the world. And I just wondered where you would see to be within the framework of two main areas, I suppose, that the need to monetize cash flow from ecosystem services and how we can better manage our biodiversity risks to move the economic cycle towards something which is conducive towards biodiversity for conservation and protection. Do you have hope? Do you feel we're on the right track? And what can we do? That is the fundamental question for this morning. Justin, well, I won't try to measure my hope, but let's say I do get out of bed in the morning. Um, and that is, uh, I guess, uh, one possible data point um, uh, and one that many of us have. But let me, you know, sort of take a bit of a hop, skip and a jump. Yeah, let me start where you started, which is with the numbers. Um, you know, there's a lens that the conservation community has sustained over many years and decades, you know, which is largely focused on money for conservation. Yeah, you know, how much money do we need to spend on conservation? And whilst that has to be validated, uh, I think uh, I would place myself and the work that I'm involved in in a slightly different way. You know, the world's financial and capital markets handle about $350 trillion worth of financial assets. Uh, and yet we talk about conservation finance in the millions or perhaps in the low billions. What we really need to do is to ensure that global private finance in the way it flows is aligned to the nature positive outcomes that science dictates that we must set. Let me kind of bring that down a little bit, both in the private space and in the public space. Let me start with public and then I'll go back to private capital flows. You know, we've all just lived through, and some of us are still living through this catastrophic pandemic. And a number of countries, as we know, have driven stimulus programs largely by borrowing and spending an awful lot of public money. Yeah, in fact, the numbers amount today to about 15 trillion US dollars mobilized and spent over the last 12 to 15 months. So that's the largest upswell of public finance in the history of civilization. Yeah, and we've done an analysis of the nature content of the commitments that were made, the programs that were developed, and the money that was dispersed. And, and the truth is, is that it's pathetic that although there are several countries, notably a few European countries, that have been more explicit about greening those steep green stimulus pro greening those stimulus programs, the vast bulk of that $15 trillion, public money, our money, tax dollars money, actually is either negative and destructive towards nature, or perhaps more positively, yeah, is not consciously thinking through how to maximize nature positive outcomes. This is not private money, this is public money, the money that really comes from our pockets day by day. 
And similarly, as we move beyond the stimulus, we reach the period of recovery where not every country, because many have fiscal space problems, but many countries, you know, will be spending a great deal to push us out of the recovery, notably in Europe, North America, and parts of Asia. Uh, and again, we see the possibility of driving those tax dollars being spent much more positively towards nature positive outcomes. We see some commitments coming out of the US, perhaps out of Brussels on behalf of Europe, one or two specific European countries, that those recovery programs will be greened. But still, we just done an analysis of the 670 billion euro that the EU is committed to spending across the EU as the recovery program. Two cents in the euro are nature positive. Two cents in the euro of what is billed as a green recovery program. Now, let me come just across to the private side. Um, let me give one sector example and then perhaps just kind of drill down a bit, although you might also want to interrupt me, Jason, Justin, and take me somewhere else. You know, the, the largest chunk, single chunk of the global economy is food, food and land use. Yeah, and by most estimates, it's about an $8 trillion business taking all aspects of food production and distribution and retail and so on into account. That's 10% of the global economy. And the World Bank estimates that the negative externalities of that $8 trillion a year is $6 trillion a year, of which a major chunk is related to negative nature outcomes, negative climate outcomes, and negative health outcomes, in fact. The good news, yeah, is that that's changing. Yeah, and that actually today, we see huge efforts, whether it be in the regenerative agriculture side, in the sort of more funky, exotic, alternate protein and vertical farming side, to begin to shape the way in which farming systems impact on nature and climate outcomes. And of course, the role of both public finance and private finance is absolutely critical in that respect. And so then let me come to my last example in this first round, which is an initiative called the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosure, TNFD. What is this? This sort of geeky sounding coalition. You know, most private sector actors that are investing money you know, they're pricing risk. They're trying to figure, is that a good investment? You know, is the risk too high compared to the financial returns we may get? You know, that's the basis on which sophisticated and very large scale investments are made on a continuous basis. Uh, and today, many of the negative nature impacts don't, uh, are not included into that risk analysis of the economic value of an investment. The Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosure is designed to change that. It's designed to drive metrics as to what a nature-positive economy would look like into the risk pricing of investments across the world. In the case of farming and land use and agriculture, um, just to illustrate, you know, that would mean instead of seeking to just only take account of short-term financial returns, you know, despite, for example, the degradation uh, of soil, the undermining, you know, of water tables, uh, perhaps the destruction of coastal zones, those factors would be increasingly priced into investment decisions across the farming system. So let me pause at that, Justin, and come back to you. That's great. That's great. Thank you. The, the, and I'm going to, I hope this can be edited out. Um, one of the things which is so very relevant is as the TNFD starts to become sort of mobilized, it is sitting alongside the uh, TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, which um, was started a few years ago um, by uh, Mark Carney, which is increasingly becoming mandatory, we hope, um, and does the same thing. It identifies physical and transition risks to do with climate change. This forms part of a regulatory process, um, which has been perhaps augmented by, for instance, the European Central Bank and Bank of England, um, asking, requiring now banks to stress test themselves against climate change. 
all, which, all of which is positive, and this will drive a regulatory process whereby capital markets, institutional investors, pension funds need to demonstrate how they are taking risk into account. And if they don't, then this will start to provide a penalty, if you wish, in the markets for exposing themselves to a risk which they could otherwise mitigate. So that will be positive. There is, however, quite a gap between how the discussions around climate are going and how the discussions around biodiversity are going. And there's a, a problem, I think, whereby biodiversity is so often seen somehow to be a separate silo, separating complete separate existence from climate change. And yet, of course, we know that climate change is a risk multiplier of a whole range of risks, including biodiversity loss. And we also know that biodiversity loss is itself a catalyst for increasing the impacts of climate change and indeed changing climate. So I was wondering if you can see, is there, a, is there a nexus here where we can bring these two things together, whereby the risks which we identify on climate change and the risks we identify on uh, biodiversity loss can somehow be put in juxtaposition to each other so that there can be a, a really comprehensive and standardized approach to looking at how these nature risks, climate and biodiversity, um, can be managed and the impact of managing that. Because it seems to me that your, your fundamental point that it's okay if we look at discrete amounts of, of new finance that can go to support particular types of activity are themselves never going to equal the sum of the parts of what's required to deal with the problem. And we know, for instance, that in the next 20 years or so, 15 years, there's going to be more infrastructure built than some people reckon that when it's ever been built before, unless that infrastructure is actually aligned to climate change and biodiversity, the damage that that will cause, cause both in terms of what is extracted, what is utilized, the energy that's used, or the pollution that will come out of it, will undermine everything that we've been doing for the last few decades. So do you see this regulatory process starting to, to coalesce in a constructive way? Yeah, so several points. Absolutely, Justin. So firstly, of course, you're absolutely right. Climate and nature are intertwined in complex dynamic ways and can't be dealt with as siloed different parts of the ecosystem. But they're also not the same. You know, the extensive draining of available water resources through, you know, poor agricultural practices, you know, is not necessarily driven by climate and measuring climate risk doesn't necessarily point one to that problem. Similarly, um, extensive plastic at sea and the implications, you know, for health. Um, yes, there are linkages to climate because plastic and climate are related, but they're also different. So, so I think we, we need to understand the complex dynamics between them and the nexus, if you like, but also to understand some of the differences and the different ways in which uh, nature specific issues need to be addressed. And that's really a message partly to the financial community saying, we understand that you're still trying to figure out climate and that's absolutely necessary, but there needs to be a sort of and integrating the nature part into that and understanding the additional pieces that need to be taken on. So that's the first bit. The second piece is to do with the changing regulatory environment. And let's focus exclusively on private finance. So to your point, um, in principle, you know, the increasing disclosure of climate and nature related risks by, for example, corporates or owners and builders of infrastructure, you know, should lead um, those with private capital to price those companies in different ways. And where there's growing nature damage um, or growing climate damage that could put those projects and companies into trouble, the price of capital goes up, you know, and that leads to a reallocation of resources. That's the sort of theory of change behind risk pricing and disclosure of climate and nature related risks. And I think it is undoubtedly going to make a difference but that process will not make a difference quickly enough at scale. And so we have to understand other parts of the policy and regulatory environment that need to augment in order to accelerate the way in which the world's financial and capital markets take nature and climate into account. I'll give you just one or two very small examples just to illustrate the point. You know, we know, for example, that the EU is pushing a directive called double materiality for short, 
which both looks at the material financial risks to the business or the investor and the impacts on society and pushing companies to have to disclose measure and disclose both you know so you have a sort of move beyond sort of narrow financial risk for the investor and the company to companies being required to report on a broader set of factors that also look at nature outcomes and climate outcomes not only the risk to themselves so that's one side then there's a second side to the story which i can illustrate you know the uk is looking at a due diligence obligation regarding deforestation that financial institutions and corporates would need to report on um, not whether there's a risk but whether in practice they're impacting on deforestation through their lending activities uh, or through their economic activities on the ground and interestingly that might turn out to have linkages to, for example, anti-money laundering regulations in countries where deforestation is significantly linked to illicit financial flows. Now, that those sorts of initiatives would accelerate the speed at which the financial community takes account of nature and climate-related risks, in addition to the sort of disclosure, risk disclosure aspects that we've described, and will push the agenda forward quickly. So we can bet on more efficient markets that take nature and climate risk into account, but we also have to advance other rules of the game that accelerate the degree to which that's the case. Um, so we spent um, the last 25 minutes or so talking about the public, uh, the public sector, uh, ODA, regulatory frameworks, uh, and what can be done at a government level with the assumption that things will mobilize the private sector finance. But of course, a really critical part of this is what the, the private individual can do, what she or he can do in their own basis when they when they go shopping, what they what they buy, uh, how they travel. And I just wondered how you see the, the, the individual, the private citizen um, entering into this space in a constructive way, because it is obviously all our actions which lead to the, the current complicated place we're in. So, you know, to start off, to, to state the blindingly obvious, um, individuals are the ultimate owners of all financial assets. You know, as borrowers, lenders, savers, taxpayers, pension policy holders, insurance policy holders, it's us. Yeah, and then we have a bunch of intermediaries called private sector. Yeah, so that's banks and asset managers and pension funds and insurance companies. And then we have another bunch of intermediaries called governments, and they spend money on our behalf, but it's actually all ours. Yeah, and I think that's the correct place to start. You know, the private sector makes it sound like it's about individuals, but it's not, it's just another bunch of intermediaries acting on our behalf. Yeah, and so the question is, how do we get more leverage over it? And Kristalina Georgieva, you know, now the managing director of the IMF has made the observation provocatively, but absolutely right, that it's high time that the financial system remembered what its actual duty is, which is to serve people. Yeah, and I would argue that over the last 20, 30 years, perhaps that critical issue and critical need and purpose ultimately, yeah, has been somewhat neglected, if not forgotten. Now, the digitalization revolution offers not a technology guarantee, but a new set of pathways for individual citizens or citizens acting collectively in new ways to get more and more involved in the way in which their money is used. Obviously, as, as spenders, yeah, we consume goods, but actually every time we buy something, a phone, we're also an investor, yeah, because we're investing in the way in which that was made uh, and in the future of what it implies. So all of our consumption decisions are also investment decisions. They affect communities, they affect climate outcomes, they affect nature outcomes, and we are increasingly informed, often through digital means, as to what the investment profile of that consumption really looks like. Yeah, so I think that's the most obvious path, about $40 trillion a year worth of consumer spending, yeah, that we should not ignore at all, but look at through an investment lens. But of course, then there's the more traditional role of investors. Yeah, you know, we're pension policy holders. Yeah, at not 
the entire world, but certainly a growing proportion of the middle class or more wealthy, better well-off uh, population of the world. And actually, if we take the EU, they have a piece of legislation that says, if you're a pension policy holder in the EU, it's the law that the pension fund has to inform the citizen and consult with the pension policy holder as to how that money should be used. Now, that law has been on the books for a while, but not really executed in a very interesting way. Yeah, but digitalization begins to change that as we think about robo cops, you know, robo investors that give us more opportunity to make decisions about the use of our own money. Yeah, indeed, also as savers. One other example, just to kind of emphasize, if you like, the extraordinary scale that can be reached through the aggregation of the actions of individuals. We've been involved in an initiative with a large Chinese fintech company called the Ant Group, you know, the Alipay payment platform that spun off of Alibaba, uh, an initiative called Ant Forest, which sits on their Alipay platform. And every time I spend money on a taxi or, you know, some other good, I get information that tells me effectively what the carbon implications of that spending is. That information is then translated into green energy points. Those green energy points are stuck into a social media gamification process that encourages me to be interested, that builds social identity around me, positively earning those energy points. Yeah, and we begin to develop a more conscious set of citizens around particular issues, in this case, carbon. Now, the amazing thing about Ant Forest is launched in August 2016. Today, it has 550 million people using it on a daily basis. It's actually the world's largest carbon market with no policy and no price. It's people being influenced by their sense of identity and relatedness to the issue and mobilizing at scale, but not through a sort of traditional take to the streets, but through a digital architecture, gamification models. And next week, no, in two weeks time, Finance for Biodiversity will launch a coalition of mobile payment platforms around the world that will seek to explore how that might relate to e-waste in one country or how it might relate to water resources in another country. My, my main point, Justin, is it's our money, so we need to take more control over it and digitalization is beginning to open new pathways that will allow us to do that. That's really encouraging, Simon, and thank you for raising that, because that does give hope. I'm so 30 or 40 years on from when all this started. Things are starting to change. We have a regulatory framework which is beginning to um, help define the trajectory of money and the way that it's spent. Uh, we have a clear understanding of the crisis that we are facing, which wasn't necessarily the case um, a few years ago. We have an understanding of the basic quanta that's required to do the the elementary change in order to ensure we don't lose the precious biodiversity that we have. And also, as you say, we have now a democratization of effectively the carbon markets, ecosystem service markets, which enables individuals to take responsibility for their actions, which is fantastic. It is that process of democratization, which I think actually may be the tide that lifts the boats here. Um, of course, if people understand the problem, and I think the other critical part of this is, is education. Uh, democracies work effectively when people understand what they're voting for and what the consequences are of voting in any particular direction. So, Simon, thank you so much.